Hello for another Café Rollist. Nothing pleases more, me more than when uh, we are traveling together through the internet to fellow tabletop RPG enthusiasts from different countries. And today I'm joined by Safia. Could you introduce yourself briefly, briefly please? Yes, hello. My name is Sophia and I am a tabletop role play gamer as well as a GM and I founded a small community that is located in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia where I'm located as well and I'm also a fantasy fiction creative writer. Awesome uh, we got a couple of ice breaking questions out for Cafe Rollis which is a spin-off show born out of the what we call the Panini situation so we don't name everything that is actually going on uh, but uh, what's your routine like uh, lately? Uh, what is it a typical day in the uh, the life of Safia? Uh, well, I suppose uh, my routine involves uh, waking up rather early to go to work first, as I do work in HR at a uh, local oil and gas company here. Afterwards, af uh, once I'm back home, um, I would try and sneak in at least 30 minutes to an hour of writing, uh, try to um, do yoga at least maybe four times in the week and uh, spend time with my cat and then hopefully have a D&D game that night. Awesome. So you, you don't work remotely at the moment, unlike a, a lot of us. Uh, no, I haven't had the chance to work remotely that much. I have had to work in the office quite a bit as my job required it anyway. And uh, did you pick up any uh, new hobbies recently or developed a, a new skill? Well, um, I don't think I've, I haven't really developed a new skill in the pandemic, but what I have done is um, explore tabletop role play gaming more. So I've started to explore a few games uh, that are uh, not quite Dungeons and Dragons because that's most of what I knew before. I've also gotten to um, work more on my writing. Um, so it's so improve an existing skill and uh, also try and take part a bit more of podcasts and really getting to know people as much as I can within the tabletop community on Twitter and even take up a few more um, writing jobs. I'm taking advantage of my own uh, segue to mention hobbies. I picked up the ukulele a year ago uh, because I'm unemployed and uh, I got time when I'm not taking care of my son. So I'm learning, I'm terrible at it, but I'm mentioning that because today, uh, this week as part of my effort to become affiliate, uh, if we reach 20 people in the chat room, I will play some ukulele after the interview. So feel free if you want me to make uh, ridicule myself a bit, feel free to bring uh, to invite a lot of your friends in the chat room. We got a little counter done there, but people are not here to hear me uh, talk about ukulele. Safia, uh, how did you get introduced to tabletop role playing game? First off, I'm actually excited. I hope we do get to see you play the ukulele. Uh, and <laughs> Thanks. answer your question about tabletop. That's because you don't know how bad I am. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how to play the ukulele, so I'm not exactly going to be much of a critic. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I, I got into tabletop role play gaming. It's something that I've always wanted to try. I've always heard about Dungeons and Dragons uh, as it's the most popular game and it's made its way into mainstream media. Um, but it started out when uh, a friend of mine decided to uh, run the starter kit Lost Minds of Pandelver. And she invited me and a group of our friends to join in and play. And after just playing a couple of sessions, I was hooked and I wanted to uh, also DM. And um, 
as usual with a lot of games, a lot of difficulty goes to scheduling. So it, it, we weren't able to have um, as many games as I would have liked. And so I just decided, okay, you know what? This is a sign. I am going to run my games. And uh, I ended up jumping into GMing after just about maybe three or four sessions of playing and haven't looked back since. So was that... <laughs> this, uh... was, this was about... Uh, uh, I think I think it's been three years now. Three years. So, oh, and was that in Saudi Arabia? Or was it during your time uh, in London? Uh, no, this was in Saudi Arabia. So, at some point, then Crossroads Guild happened. So, what is it, and how did it happen? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, the Crossroads Guild happened not too long after that. Um, when I really got into playing D and D with my friends, I wanted to have uh, I wanted to find more people that uh, will play the game, uh, that are into the game, and so I started looking around online to see if there's an existing community or anything, maybe maybe a hidden gem I didn't know about. Um, I did find one. And I got so excited and I signed up for them. Um, but I was, uh, and I had filled the form that they had, which asked what video games have you played and what's your experience with tabletop gaming and things like that. So I filled in the form and I was super excited. And then they responded back by saying, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we only take in serious gamers. And I wasn't sure what that meant. And out of curiosity, I went and I took a list of took a look at the list of the members, and they were all male. And I started wondering if it's because I'm female that they said no. I never found out, and I never knew. But I decided that the next step is to make my own community. <laughs> so I made my own group, and that became the Crossroads Guilds. Okay, you will tell me afterwards uh, what's the name of their group. We, we don't diss people on the show, but you tell me afterwards, and if they contact me, I will tell them, ah, you're not serious gamers, you know, for me. You're not the, you're not the real deal. You're not playing. Apparently, I was not aware of that. Uh, I like to present myself the least knowledgeable podcasters in the hobby. And we've got Sylvie from Carney Side Show here telling me that you played with Satine Phoenix, who's a friend of the show. Yeah. So that's yes, that's some serious D and D cred there. You know, you can show up in clubs and be like, "Am I serious? Am I serious? Did you play with Satine Phoenix? I did." <laughs> yeah, and, and that was uh, being invited to Satine's game was pretty huge. Um, I had done an interview with women of D and D who have um, who who are these fantastic uh, ladies highlighting other women in uh, D and D. And then not long after, Satine contacted me and asked me to join a game. And um, my first reaction was to uh, jump around <laughs> and sort of like just, just look at my phone and then put it aside like, no, no, what, what? I had to send a screenshot to my friends. <laughs> uh, and then after I felt like I could re react. I finally responded, trying to look calm, like, oh, yes, of course, I'd love to. And inside, I am not so calm. <laughs> Excellent. So Crossroads Guilds, what is it? Is it an online group or is it a, a air quote, physical group? Uh, do, do you gather weekly, monthly? Uh, how does it work and what is it? So it started in the time before COVID, which meant we had the luxury of meeting in person before, uh, before the world became a little bit more difficult to interact in person. Um, and we, it started out with me just making this group on a, an application that allows you to make uh, hangouts. And um, I just posted it, not expecting to find a lot of people. And um, it, of course I had my, my, my friends that are also into gaming as part of it, uh, but I wanted to meet others. And so I set up just a introduction to Dungeons and Dragons kind of talk just to see if people will jump in. 
and I went to a cafe and I set up my uh, DMing um, uh, board and the books and I had the dice and I'm just sitting there alone in a cafe and I'm wondering if anyone will even show up because I had people sign up on uh, uh, on the application but you know what if they just bail um, and I ended up with about 20 people 20? and my voice wow. wasn't loud enough to <laughs> Yeah, my voice wasn't loud enough to project for them to all hear me, but I just, I was just in this pretty crowded cafe uh, and 20 people around me just listening me, to me talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And the amazing thing is not all of them were actually new to the hobby. Some of them had actually been playing before, but just saw, wait, there's a group. Let's jump on that. And so they joined and they helped me explain. And some of them had been um, game designers as well. And then there were others that were completely new to the whole thing. And then probably the tip of the iceberg on this, or rather, sorry, the cherry on top of this is um, uh, one person passed by and just paused and looked at us and say, wait, is that D&D? Can I join? And you know, I, I, I really didn't expect uh, so many people to be interested in tabletop gaming. Um, so it's been fantastic. And every time more people find the community, they uh, are always saying, oh my God, I didn't know that there'd be a community here. Um, uh, and this is, this is great. Um, so that has been very uplifting. And um, we used to be able to gather um, it started, there was a point where at most it was every other month, sometimes once every three months. Um, and then when we would have an event, it, we, we'd have uh, about four or five different tables, each with five to six players, different games happening, all of them beginner friendly. Um, all of them were Dungeons and Dragons as that's, that's what everyone was really craving to play. So I was wondering about that. So you always meet in a, in, well, until recently, uh, as recently as a year ago, uh, you always meet in a in a in a in a cafe. Then uh, it was started out at a, at a cafe, yes. And then when I got to holding uh, workshops, uh, we needed a quieter place for workshops because some people wanted to learn how to make characters with a bit more of guidance. So I was able to contact uh, this very beautiful. A local library that we have that well I can't even just call it a library it's more of a um, a uh, it's a world culture center but there's a part of it that is a library and they would give us a room to uh, basically hold our hold our D and D workshops and I felt silly you know contacting a huge cultural uh, building asking them for a room for my table uh, tabletop gaming community but they were very happy to help. So uh, my next question is, is a bit, well, you, you are a writer uh, yourself. Do you write a, a fantasy? Are they novels, short stories? What, what is your, your work? Is it published and available? So um, the work that I have done, uh, not quite. So, OK, I'll step back. So the work that I mainly do is I am working on a novel and hoping to finish it up to work on being published. And that will be a, um, uh, a full-fledged fantasy series. The work that I have completed that, it, that is published, I was hired to write a, um, uh, one of the first uh, massive multiplayer online role-play games that were created in the region and specifically within Saudi. Um, I wrote the game. Um, in English, but the game was translated to Arabic as that is the end audience, but it had to be in English because you had people in China working on the game and, and other countries. So um, uh, I wrote the game in English and I was in charge of writing the lore as well as writing the quest and dialogue. And I had the story part and the game was focused on um, uh, uh, children and it was educational, but I got uh, I got to focus on the story and not the educational side. Um, so that was the first project I had done that was published. Uh, and uh, afterwards, um, 
I'd also just mainly focused on uh, my own writing and recently have jumped back into uh, finding a way to write also within the tabletop gaming uh, a, a field of community, which has been fantastic. Uh, actually worked on a, um, a, a short story that was uh, published under uh, the the game of Azag, which was with Bank Dungeons. Lex Madrake was here in the chat. So uh, I don't know how much you can tell me about this project, but uh, can you tell us? Uh, you, you know, the classical Dungeons and Dragons got these distorted uh, Western European inspirations, which are so remote from whatever they inspired in the first place. Uh, but uh, does your own fantasy is set in a in a setting which is more inspired by by Saudi Arabia itself? Yeah, that's actually a big part of something that I'd like to do in fantasy. Um, I think fantasy can be anything you want it to be. It can be um, whatever cultural inspiration or none. Um, so we we've always gotten used to fantasy being. Uh, re representing, say, a medieval Europe. But there's nothing to say it can't be, say, North African or um, Central African, or in the case that I'm writing, um, it can be more Arab uh, focus and Arab history, which spans such a huge, rich uh, part of culture from, if you look at pre-Islamic Arabia to post-Islamic Arabia, there's just an insane amount of, of, of places to draw from. And I've always been uh, craving different uh, representation in fantasy that is not your stereotypical medieval uh, Europe. Because, I mean, if you pause and just think, even within medieval Europe, there's so much that hasn't been shown in fantasy. Like, you've only just seen a small, tiny slice of it that has become popular and became the standard. But even medieval Europe is much larger than that. <laughs> Yeah, I highly recommend people to go check because medieval Europe does was what does that even mean? Uh, you know what often is referred as the Dark Ages of Europe, and I, I was listening to a, a very good show called All Fake History, and one episode was about was there a Dark Age, uh, in and <laughs> and the way he looked at it uh, in much more detail than I will hear was well, first of all, there was not a Dark Age for the world. There was maybe a Dark Age for Europe. Then you go in Europe with, well, there might have been a dark age for a part of Europe, Western Europe, but it was certainly not a dark age for Spain, which was uh, uh, at the time uh, through a golden age uh, under the, the Muslim world. <laughs> so yeah, what is a dark age? And then you look at this dark age and all those stereotypes about the, the medieval, the big armor and all of that and the, the castle in stone and so on. And that's what gives you Lord of the Rings and D&D. But you're entirely right. It's not the same in every country at every time. Uh, is it the time of the Frank or is it higher, later, mid middle age? It's quite, uh, it's, it's quite complex. Uh, I would say I think there's definitely a, a big appetite, uh, at, at least from Europe and I believe also from the US, uh, to to consume, to be exposed to content with those uh, those inspiration, this origin. But uh, sadly, they often been the subject. Well, first, sadly, they they've been often the one we were exposed to were produced uh, by Westerners, and then you got the issue of, of Orientalism. So I think there's definitely a uh, air quote market of people would be would love to have more games with uh, uh, Middle Eastern influences, uh, and yeah, it would it would it would be great if those things uh, well it, those things should be written by people from the Middle East. Yeah, definitely. I think um, you've you've raised some fantastic points that I couldn't have said any better myself. Um, there is really a huge appetite for this, and it is something that does need to be written by a author from that region. Whether you're talking um, Chinese or Filipino or say uh, Algerian or any any type of history you're looking at, it's better for someone who is either close to that region or really from that region to avoid any issues like Orientalism. And I think 
what we have today that obviously writers say in the 70s or any other time before or at the beginning of D&D didn't have is we have the internet. It is so much easier now to be able to find an author of just about any demographic, a game designer of any demographic and so on, so that you can uh, work on these projects. And of course, these authors now can find publishers and they can find artists. So we, we, we have such a fantastic tool of connectivity that these projects, whether say a novel or a video game or a tabletop game, it's all very much possible. And the only thing is who's going to do it and how many people will do it because, I mean, I'd be happy to see so much more representation that it gets to the point where you're spoiled for choice. I think that would be great. Yeah, because it's sort of the next step also when you know when there's little representation you you're like oh i'd like some games from the middle east and you know the first game that come out they tend to come across as or not come across but they are they are received as oh so that's the way it is there well no because it's not monolithic over there either so people will have different perspective on different things and you need all of them to to have a yeah you can have ideally you can have access to all of them and it's it's such a joy to see the, this diverse range of views on something which is slightly different than your your own context uh you did i understand yeah. wrongly but did you talk about that on asian represent Yes, so on Asian Represents, I am one of the cast members that does go through reading uh, the setting of Al Qadim. Al Qadim is um, a, a second edition, uh, advanced DD uh, game setting and book that is inspired by uh, A Thousand and One Nights and films of, uh, uh, of, of Arabic culture more so than, say, actual Arabic culture. Although even in the introduction, they, they state that. And they do say that um, they did get uh, an Arabic uh, linguist expert, uh, professor, professors of Arabic language to help with some of the, uh, the names and the words. So just if you were to read uh, that introduction and where the um, uh, inspiration came from, uh, 1001 Nights is not even an Arabic story. It's, um, and it's, it's become an amalgamation of so many different things. However, um, we, we look at the content, all of it, and because in the end, uh, it is uh, attempting to reflect an Arab-inspired setting, we do look at it in that context as well. Um, so I'm one of the cast members and the team behind Asian Represents have been doing fantastic work at looking at so many different other settings as well and um, uh, pushing to have more um, uh, Asian representation and Asian voices overall. Um, and uh, we, we record about an episode a month and I also uh, look at uh, different books within the uh, Al Qadim setting with my good friend um, Ahmed Al Jabiri, uh, who also has another community located here in Saudi Arabia uh, called Arabia 20. Except we look at it from, okay, as GMs, if we are going to run this setting, and he's actually going to be running it as well, um, what will we take? What will we change? And what will we keep the same? So it's it's a little bit more of a of a personal look as to how would we as people approach this rather than say a critical read. Did you perchance had ever a look at? I'm I'm curious because I, I I wondered about that a couple of times. There's a there's a French game called Cafana who also claims to have uh, uh, the uh one sorry uh, i got the title in french now in my head uh the thousand and one uh stories uh, as their inspiration and it's available in english now i believe through modifius or spelljammer press uh and i always wondered i, I don't know if they had a sensitive reader sensitivity reader or if uh if if that game was known in the middle east in any way and and perceived as uh interesting or or the opposite uh, of problematic so I, I don't know if you ever heard of that one um i personally haven't um but then again there's quite a few games that i'm still uh learning about that 
many of the others within the tabletop gaming in the Middle East are far more versed than I am, um, as I was within the realm of Dungeons and Dragons for quite some time, and, and now I'm venturing out and learning about so many other uh, different games. But no, I have not heard of that game, but I do really want to check it out. Great. I, I will send you the, the details. Um, but all about, uh, you know, showcasing a bit uh, writers from uh, the Middle East rather than uh, <laughs> criticizing the, the one from the, the uh, Western world who already have enough exposure as it is uh, negative or positive. Uh, so do you write also? Uh, do you game design? Do you write uh, content for games, Dungeons and Dragons or others? Uh, so yes, uh, I, I I am picking up into writing for tabletop role play gaming. Uh, it's been a fun new experience for me, and um, uh, the first uh, tabletop gaming uh, uh, short story that I wrote for and helped within the lore and the uh, history creation and coming up with fun NPC tables. That was um, uh, a game called Azag, which uh, is now available on Itch.io. And uh, it also comes with some great music soundtracks too. Uh, so that was one of the first games that I had uh, uh, written for. And it was fun because I got to represent um, a little bit of uh, a mix of uh, Arabic as well as North African culture. So this was a, a fun way to, to induct a little bit different things. And the history, the, the setting itself is also a Bronze Age and has this strange feel to it. So it was a lot of fun to do. I'm also venturing into writing um, my own content that will be uh, me as well as other community members within the Crossroads Guild. And I'm looking to create content that is going to be Arabic history as inspired. So, and, and they, they can be uh, anything that you can add into any city. So uh, Arabic style taverns and cafes and restaurants with food and NPCs and all of that. So that can be plopped into any setting. It doesn't have to make perfect sense where, oh, Arabic, Arabic inspired city, therefore Arabic inspired cafe. No, you can just plop that into any location, any cosmo cosmopolitan city if you have it. And so these are the kind of things that um, no one will need to worry too much about culturally appropriating because they'll have a simple, easy guide that'll make it fun and be inspired by history because uh, I'm not a history expert, but I, I love reading about history as much as I can. <laughs> I think it's great to engage with history. I always, uh, I'm a bit disappointed how much it's uh, tabletop RPG fans tend to to be overly concerned, not even with the accuracy. They, they're overly concerned with the accuracy of history, but it turns out that because they are not historian and even or knowledge of history, even even uh, as a society with all the the, the data we gathered is it, flawed, they tend to to stick to trying to be accurate to something which is not accurate, which is a misconception about the past. Because you mentioned, I love this idea of having NPCs and content to insert in your non-Persian, uh, non-Middle Eastern, uh, Persia is not uh, in this area of the world, of the world sorry, but uh, <laughs> your non-Middle Eastern world having Middle Eastern inspired characters actually is way more on point with history than people realize. I um, I got the privilege here. I went for a cycle uh, route and I stopped at the National Gallery. So I have had all those beautiful painting that uh, Britons bought or stole somewhere. And there was this painting of an Italian merchant in the 13th century in the Netherlands and other pictures of uh, people of Muslim faith living in Venice in other times of history. So we were not living in this uh, uh, epinal picture of or everyone, everyone in France in the 13th century, there was no strangers. Or you went in Germany, they were all Germans. Well, no, there was no Germany. There was no France. Or it, France was this tiny little thing in the middle. And you had Burgundy, which was much bigger. And the king of England was French somehow. So, And Belgium was part of Spain. And 
those things were already cosmopolitan yeah. before, much more cosmopolitan than we imagine, or what is represented in uh, in the media most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The world made its connections uh, uh, quite early, and um, it's it's it was it happened. Uh, even if you were to look at a very broad medieval, you could still have have more cosmopolitan times. And you don't really have to stick to a certain time frame anyway. You can mix and match and take what you like. Um, I like the point you made about not needing to be absolutely historically accurate. You just need to set what are you doing. If if you are just being inspired, uh, you're if you're making proper uh, respectful homage to that uh, inspiration, then you're you're really good to go. <laughs> so what, what what was the title you said of that project uh, about uh, creating NPCs or? Uh, shops, uh, venues that for people. Ah, uh, we we don't we cannot have the names. So we can Google it every month uh, to find out when it's out. <laughs> I will announce uh, once I'm able to have a bit more information. But it will be a project that is going to be a collaboration from um, artists that are all located within the Middle East, uh, and myself writing and hopefully uh, will come out sooner than I can, hopefully will come out soon. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, are there other projects, maybe by other people uh, in Saudi Arabia, which uh, you think are, are worth having a look at? Um, well, to be fair, there's, there, there aren't that many tabletop content creators within Saudi Arabia. Um, we do have, uh, the gaming scene is growing. So I think in time, tabletop role-based gaming will also grow and people will create content. Uh, we do have people working on creating and designing their own games that will be in Arabic. Uh, nothing quite published yet, but once that is, I'm going to be spamming that as much as I can. However, my um, a friend of mine, um, uh, who also runs the other community in Saudi Arabia, Arabia 20. He was actually hired to be a cultural consultant for um, a, uh, a, a remake of one of the books under the um, Zahara campaign setting, Al Qadim campaign setting, where they upgraded it to match fifth edition. So from second edition to fifth edition, he was hired as a cultural consultant to work on um, uh, refreshing it to, to match a better standard that we live in today's standard of representation. Uh, so that was something I'm very happy that they hired someone from the region to uh, be a cultural consultant. Exciting. This, this can be found on, on um, the uh, uh, DM's Guild. Uh, and it was actually for quite some time a uh, platinum and gold bestseller. <laughs> Feel free to drop a link in the, the chat room and I will copy paste it and, and include it in the description of the episode for, for people or you, you can send it uh, to me afterwards. Uh, I think over the last year, uh, it's been more and more uh, visible slash uh, easy for someone like me to, to get a feel of what is going on in Southeast Asia or Latin America thanks to the hashtag RPGC and uh, RPG Latam. Uh, is there anything like that for Saudi Arabia or the Gulf states uh, or a project to do something like that uh, on Twitter? So so everyone is easy to find and you, you just add that to your favorites and, and they pop up. Well, we don't have that yet, but it is something we are working on. So what's been fun is that uh, myself and, all, and and quite a few of the other community leaders within the region, uh, being Middle East and North Africa, we have been uh, reaching and finding each other. And the goal is to hopefully create a Middle East and North Africa convention. And uh, this will not only have our players interact, but also hopefully have more creators uh, be able to feel inspired and start publishing more content that is from the region. And uh, that is something we are working to create and 
hopefully will lead to, as you say, making that hashtag that will uh, make it easier to find people. I've um, only been able to find people mostly through uh, a word of mouth or through one person re re retweeting and then, oh, that's an Arab name and they're playing a game. Okay, so it's, it has been a bit more of an investigative search, um, but uh, where it is, it's growing. Um, if you had asked me three years ago if I if I would be meeting so many different uh, uh, GMs and players within the region, some of them have been uh, GMing for twenty years or more, and some of them have been uh, creating content. I I honestly uh, would have told you no. I don't think that exists here, and I am so happy to have been proven wrong. That sounds great. Do you think it was, you know, this growth, this development, do you think it was impaired or supported by by COVID? Because I see a lot more online engagement in the tabletop RPG community all across the board because people cannot meet with their usual little group of players. So they, they need to get out there and engage with more people. So yeah, do you think it played a part into uh, the, this flourishing which might be happening at the moment? And I definitely think it played a part. I think it was an accidental assistance to its growth. Um, it has made more people want to explore the hobby, especially people that might have been always wanting to, but they never quite had the time. And um, one thing I can I can say for sure is it enabled me to um, uh, be a player <laughs> because um, I've been I've been GMing for so long I know I I don't always get a chance to play so um, I was able to find um, more groups to play with and now I'm in uh, one really large campaign that has eight people that for the most part are there for every game, especially when COVID first hit, we were having four games a week. It was, it was intense, but everyone was happy. And um, for my own um, uh, group that IGM, um, uh, we, so because of scheduling and how difficult it was at best, we would have a session a month because that was as much as we could manage to schedule. Um, so the, the group IGM is, it's an all girl group. Uh, they lovingly named our group never meet because <laughs> we're hardly able to meet. Um, but with COVID, we have been able to have a session almost every single week and sometimes twice a week. So that is something that would never have happened, uh, uh pre COVID. <laughs> I think you, you got a lost opportunity uh, there because uh, if it's a D&D &D group and it's all ladies and you never meet, it could have been never meter as in never winter. <laughs> well, we went after, uh, we had one one character that was from the island of Evermeet. Oh. So that's where it, where it came up. <laughs> so, so their character was from the Elven Island ever meet <laughs> excellent so do did you um do you play other games than dungeons and dragons or do you have some favorites uh so i haven't been able to join in and play another game uh aside from D, &D except one uh and that was when i uh was able to go to a um uh, a gaming convention that took place in bahrain uh, and Bahrain is about, uh, without traffic, about less than an hour away from here. So I got to go there and uh, meet some fantastic uh, tabletop gaming um, uh, community members of the Bahraini community, uh, Tabletop House Bahrain. And um, over there, I uh, got to play Sword and Sorcery. Uh, which was uh, a whole different system for me. And it was the first time I played uh, something that wasn't Dungeons and Dragons as I never had much of a chance to play other games. Um, so that was one thing I had tried and I did like how, how much more, uh, how the system operated with, with uh, different dice and it felt like it let me role play a little bit more. 
Um, so that was one game I had tried that I really liked and I would love to play more of. I also um, did try the game Azag that uh, is by Dank Dungeons. And uh, I had, I felt a, like trying these two games and seeing the fact that you could come up with a character or have a character sheet right there and then immediately play in that same session was for me who has been used to D&D &D, a little bit mind blowing like, oh wow, it can be this easy. I didn't know this. And I love the character creation Dungeons and Dragons, don't get me wrong, but that was a whole new experience. But it's on purpose, you know, uh, I think uh, that's, you know, it's kind of my little, uh, the little thing I'm trying to, to encourage D&D &D fans to, to be a bit more curious towards other games. And the, the first reply uh, I often get is that, oh, it, it's been already so complicated to learn Dungeons & Dragons. But they, the other games are not as complicated. <laughs> the fifth edition is less complicated than the other editions, but it's still very complicated, especially by modern standards. Yeah. You, we've got games which are one page, <laughs> just one page. <laughs> yeah. And your character yeah. is pretty gen. You don't need and, to worry uh... about that. Yes, and that's something that I'm I'm so excited to try more of. In fact, um, one thing that I'm going to try and to do is to choose indie games, and I want to focus more on on indie games um, that are simple and easy, and run uh, one of those, if not every month, every other month for my community to try and introduce uh, um, the idea that okay. If you feel overwhelmed, or if you feel, um, uh, you could say, um, a little bit uh, scared of having to know everything in, in D and D, that's okay. You can. There's so many other games. Tabletop roleplay gaming is huge, and I admit I I did stick to D and D for so long, but it's because uh, it, it, you know you're in that hole, and it's so it's it's it, it's so amazing. There's so much to do. There's so much to look at. You just feel like, okay, okay, but but I'm still learning this. <laughs> but now that I have a better grasp of it, and I've I've uh, read a few of the books, and I've played in a in a campaign, and I'm running my campaign as well for quite for about two years now. Um, I do feel like, okay, you know what? Yes, it's it's been long enough. It's time to go see so many other systems that are there. <laughs> uh, so other systems, you everything you brought up was pretty much uh, ancient times fantasy. Uh, would you be interested to to write or see games which are more contemporary? It could, it could still be fantasy or even science fiction in a Middle Eastern uh, setting. Like I'd be very curious to see middle eastern supplements for vampire the masquerade or cyberpunk or or anything really uh yeah are, are, do these attract you in any way of course definitely honestly if if when, especially lately when i hear about any setting that isn't your stereotypical um uh, let's say the average fantasy setting uh, or even sci-fi setting, I am very happy to jump on it. Um, there's been some great Kickstarters created by people of different uh, cultural demographics that I am so happy to see that even if I don't know when I'll have time to play that game, I am happy to go immediately and I don't even need the details. I just see the writing looks great, the art looks great, the creators behind it are of that um, of the region that they're representing, whether um, broad African culture or say something more specific, I just immediately go, I'm like, yes, I need to consume this. Excellent. But, you know, going back to your idea of playing uh, an indie game every three or two or four sessions, I, I think even if your thing uh, is D&D &D and you want to stick with D&D, &D, playing those games every now and then they can give you ideas which will enhance or color the way you you dungeon master or the way you play because suddenly what, what's nice with those games is that they they showcase different parts of the story of the experience of being a, a hero or a character so so it's quite interesting for your for your role play and your storytelling skills to engage with that even i I've been encouraging people to even try it if they have a, a world 
like a D&D world, it's their world and they don't want to leave their world, to consider play a, a legend or a story they heard or a, a couple of NPCs or something that's going to happen somewhere with another game, develop what is going on and it, they can integrate it to their world and, and visit that later with the D&D rules with their regular group. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think um, it's a great way to challenge you creatively because um, I've realized how uh, Dungeons and Dragons can end up making you constantly think, uh, okay, but do the rules allow? Do the rules allow? Or um, And, you know, that's the way that the game was designed and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's refreshing to try something else where... Um, you don't have to pause and really think about that 50,000 times. <laughs> yeah, and people, it's it's interesting how, it's not limited to D&D, it's the case also with traditional games. I like the rule of cool, but it's been the debate of, yeah, but if you rule of cool a lot, maybe it's because your system is aimed at doing something in D&D. Uh, you can do other stuff, but the system is made to punch things in the face. <laughs> When you when you level up, you get better in punching things in the face. It can be punching things magically in the face or punching things uh, with a arrow in the face, but it's still punching things most of the time. While other games, uh, yeah, they they focus on uh, on other aspects of the experience. Yeah, no, um, you can definitely take any gaming system and do with it whatever you'd like, you know, in the end, it's your game, but it is a whole different discussion if you're just going to look at, okay, this is how the, how this game is designed and written, and you're going to look at it from game design versus other game design, then um, that whole discussion uh, is different. You know, if, it, like you said, if you uh, are going with rule of cool, that is a great house rule that you can use and everyone's free to use it. But it's it's not helpful uh, to the conversation of discussing game design. Um, what is the game design's objective, and what is it focusing on? In this case, with uh, Dungeons and Dragons, although I never felt uh, constrained for role play, it could just be because um, I've had great dungeon masters that were very happy to push for role play, and so. I experienced their game as it is. And, you know, um, when I have tried other systems and I realized, okay, this system is really encouraging uh, me to not really look at my character sheet because my character sheet is like three stats. <laughs> so uh, we're getting close to the one hour mark. Uh, is there anything you want to bring up that we did not discuss yet? Uh, we have covered um, a good number of things. The, the one thing that I do want to uh, bring up is one project uh, that I am, um, that is very much close to my heart right now, is creating a survey that will cover uh, insights into the Middle East and, and North Africa of what is tabletop role play gaming like in this region. This is everything from demographics to play style to um, interest in gaming, as well as uh, GMing and being able to create content and uh, uh, appetite to GM versus only to play. So that is available on my Twitter account and it is pinned and it's also on um, the community uh, Twitter account as well and the website. So that had being able to reach more people within the region or people that identify with the region or people uh, that are residing in the region. So this also covers expatriates and um, uh, other nationals living here. So this would give us a great outlook to understanding what is gaming like here. And the concept is to repeat this every single year and to track the trend of the growth because we all know it's gonna grow. It's just a matter of how is it gonna grow and in which direction. Is it open to, uh, because I'm thinking of RPGC, uh, if, if I'm not wrong, I might be wrong about that, but I think uh, within RPGC, there's a number of individuals who are uh, first or second generation immigrants outside of 
the actual geographical region. So is your survey uh, open also to to people f uh, who have origins from Africa or the Middle East, but might be living in the UK, in France or Germany and so on? Um, if So it would be more those that uh, are that either grew up here mm -hmm. or yeah, okay. have, have enough understanding of the region because they they will um, more have experienced tabletop role play gaming within the country of which they grew up in. So that it, or so it's it's more of if you've lived here long enough to identify with it, um, or, and if you are uh, from the region. So if someone say. Um, hasn't ever uh, been influenced by even their their say original na na their original ethnicity in tabletop gaming it wouldn't quite uh, cover up so it's mostly um, nationals uh, people that have lived here for a good several years and uh, any um, uh, and that also covers uh, ex expatriates okay. I will um, send you the link to the survey great great and I, I will share around. Uh, I will take advantage of this to recommend people listening to this, watching this, to go check uh, Dum Dum Die, uh, which is a sort of South Africa-based uh, podcast in which they play Dungeons and Dragons, and I highly recommend. And to check also the work of Alan uh, Cudicio, uh, I hope I pronounce his name properly, who is a uh, he lives in Germany right now. He grew up in. Italy, I believe, but he's from Africa and he's designing a game called Guagadu Chronicles, which is a MMORPG with a, possibly a, a tie-in uh, role-playing game. So uh, yeah, uh, I recommend people to go check uh, check that out. And I, I'll make sure to uh, to point to you a few people who uh, might, uh, yeah, maybe I know and you don't happen to, to know of them. And, uh, and I hope you will send me people because I really, really sincerely would like to have more guests from the Middle East and Africa. So uh, if you please tell me about them and if you uh, people uh, who are not being interviewed now, but watching this, please, if you are one of these person, if you know one, feel free to send them my way. I will be uh, honored to have them on my microphone. You mentioned your Twitter. Where can people find you when you wish to be found on social media and everything? Yeah, so you can find me at Twitter uh, at Sophia underscore D and on Instagram at Sophia D-U-L-A-I-J-A-N, Sophia Dilejan. Um, and I'm very happy to have been here. I'll definitely be uh, uh, sending you some people to look into as well. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah, th thank you so much. Uh, people, everything uh, which was brought up, we will try to list in the description of the episode. So please go ahead there uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this uh, in audio. I uh, will include also a link to my own game, which is great to play in between a few sessions of Dungeons & Dragons, by the way. It's called Paris Gondo, The Life-Saving Magic of Inventoring. It's a game which starts where most adventures end. You finish the dungeon, you are in the final room, you defeated the boss even of that dungeon, and you have found some loot, but now you have to make the difficult decision of deciding which of this loot and from your starting inventory which objects spark joy and which objects you want to keep before engaging on the journey home and before finding out if you have an emotional epilogue in which you have a fulfilling experience till the rest of your days thanks to all the objects surrounding you so please head to itch.io to find Paris Gondo the life-saving magic of inventoring soon to be available in French, in addition to the current edition in English. Thank you so much, Safia. And uh, thanks, people in the chat room. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, I'm going to cut here for the, for the, the YouTube of the episode.